Well, hello, Walden Church. There is a small book of Jude in the back of your New Testament, and in that book, there is a really good verse that I think could start our time together well. Verse 11 says, Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. <laughs> okay, so why is that important? Well, it's important because it demonstrates the value of knowing your history. Here, in this case, your nation's history. Jude is written in a time when people didn't have personal copies of the Bible, and they certainly didn't have copies of history. That was, that was you know, unheard of. But still, the people of God were expected to know those things, even though they didn't have them written down. And that's a good place for us to begin because it shines a light for you and me that we should also know our history. Church history is a subject of which I think many people are ignorant and many people haven't taken that time to maybe learn where we've come from. We have a responsibility though, not just to study God and to study the scriptures, but to understand how we arrived where we are, right? What, what is our church history? Spanish-American philosopher George Santillana said, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And of course, our time here, it's gonna be short, so we're not gonna have time to cover every single aspect, but we could look at a lot of the high points which help us understand how we arrived to where we are today. After the resurrection, Jesus comes back from the dead and he says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away, for I do not go away. The helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So Jesus had been with his disciples for 40 days, right? And he then ascends into heaven. And so the disciples and, and those that were closest to Jesus, they all gather in the upper room and for 10 days they pray. Acts 2 says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared and rested upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This moment in church history is called Pentecost. Pentecost means the 50th day. And so it's celebrated 50 days or seven weeks after Easter. And this coming of the Holy Spirit, it fulfilled that promise that Jesus made, that if I don't go, the Spirit will not come, and that that Spirit of God would be our helper. So the Spirit's coming empowered the disciples, and it gave birth to the early church. Now, the word church in the Bible is uh, the word ecclesia. Ecclesia means congregation, it means crowd, it means group. This first church is made up of Jews, right? So they are they're converts of Judaism, and as a result of Christianity, they are now considered to be a sect of Judaism. It's certainly right to say that Christianity grew out of Judaism. As Christ, the G, you know, Jesus, he is the prophesied Messiah of the Old Testament. But it might be more appropriate to say that Christianity is Judaism completed. You know, because Christ came and he fulfilled the Old Testament law. He established a new covenant based on everything he did on the cross. And so it wasn't long after the establishment of the church that the gospel then goes out to people who are not Jews, right? It goes out to the Gentiles. Acts 15 says, Peter stood up and said to them, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. The man most responsible to bring this gospel to the Gentiles was the Apostle Paul. We've been talking about him for a couple of days. And the irony here is, as we've looked at Paul, 
we've noticed that Paul is a product of the old temple model. All of Paul's life, he's raised with sacred buildings, sacred preachers, and sacred sacrifices. And now he's an evangelist for Jesus and the new thing that Jesus made called church. The time of ministry among the disciples went on until every single last one of them died. Uh, Many of them were imprisoned. Many of them were martyred for their faith. One of the first dates that you learn as a Bible student is A.D. 70. This is the war between Rome and the Jews, and probably a worse war story than you have ever heard. It starts with Florus, who is the Roman governor of Judea. He raids the temple treasury and seized 17 talents. And his excuse was that they were needed for imperial forces. This led to a riot, and Florius's response was then to take leading citizens in Jerusalem, just indiscriminately, and crucify them. Vespasian was dispatched in 68 to begin the siege of Jerusalem to stop the rioting, but when he heard that Emperor Nero had died, he left that battle and went to Rome to be crowned, and he left his son Titus in charge of the battle. The first big move was during Passover. Titus entered the city with his army, and he killed a million people. They tried to make peace, but there wasn't a treaty that could be made. Some of the Jews even leapt over the wall and uh, joined Rome and decided to fight for Rome. Titus then built a wall around the city to make sure that there was no food or supplies that could get in. And then that, of course, led to hunger and people started eating anything. There are reports that the soldiers ate the leather from their armor. There, Josephus says that there were some people that resorted to cannibalism. Titus attacks again, this time the temple, He wants to save it, but because his own men are in danger, he gave orders to stop at nothing, and it was, everything was set on fire. Finally, the whole temple was set on fire, and there was just bloodshed everywhere. The soldiers went crazy, uh, bloodthirsty. All that hatred that had been building up in their hearts was let loose, and the Roman soldiers killed everything in sight. Uh, Children, old men, priests, they plundered all the gold and silver. In fact, history says that so much gold was taken from the temple that the, gold, uh, the price of gold dropped in the Syrian gold market to less than half its value. And since that time, there has been no sacrifices, right? No sacrifices for the Jewish people since. In the centuries that follow, the establishment of the church, uh, schisms within the church, they start to develop, and there begins all these heresies that start to arise. And on top of that, there is persecution from Rome. Christians suffered from sporadic and localized persecutions over a period of two and a half centuries. Their refusal to participate in Roman faith was considered an act of treason, and it was punishable by execution. The most widespread official persecution was carried out by Diocletian uh, beginning in 303. During the Great Persecution, the emperor ordered Christian buildings and the homes of Christians torn down There are sacred books collected and burned. Christians were arrested, tortured, mutilated, burned, starved, and condemned in the gladiator arenas to be watched by spectators. 312 is the next big date to remember. This is the year that Emperor Constantine becomes a Christian. And during the battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine sees a vision. It's a cross-shaped chalice or a trophy that's formed high in the sky right about, you know, mid-afternoon. It's blazing with light. And the history books say about the time of the midday sun, when the day was just turning, he said he saw with his own eyes up in the sky and resting over the sun, a cross-shaped trophy formed from light and a text attached to it that said, by this conquer. Amazement at the spectacle seized both him and the whole company of soldiers, which was then accompanying him on a campaign he was conducting somewhere and witnessed the miracle. A year later, in 313, official persecution uh, ended with the Edict of Milan, which made Christianity legal in the Roman Empire, and it was signed by the emperor. Now, there was great speculation as to whether Constantine's conversion was real. 
It didn't really come forth in his behavior, and he wasn't baptized until he was on his deathbed. But it's obvious that Constantine's conversion led ultimately to Christianity becoming the official religion of the empire. By AD 400, the terms Roman and Christian were synonymous. And in 1095, we had the Crusades. What were the Crusades? The Crusades were eight religious wars, uh, mostly between Christians and Muslims, started primarily to secure control of holy sites that were considered sacred by both groups. It's estimated that close to five million people died in the Crusades. How ironic that Christians went from being persecuted to being people who persecuted others for not being Christian. And all the while proclaiming this in the name of Jesus, a savior who told us to love our neighbors and who also said that he lived in our hearts and not buildings. And then through the next few centuries, Christianity spread far and wide and church councils were held in an attempt to establish uh, official doctrinal positions to combat false teaching, to combat heresy. And this led to a lot of great doctrines and a lot of great creeds to be written. It also also led to the dissension within the church, which created the Protestant Reformation. The reformers were called Protestants because they were protesting false teaching and corruption within the Roman church. Now, they felt that the church of Jesus had gone too far away from the things that Jesus had started. Jesus said, no holy temples, and they were building temples. Jesus said, you're all equal, and the Romans were establishing priests who were highly controlling the narrative because they were the only ones that had the word of God, so it, the word of God wasn't in the hands of their, their own people. So the, the message was being controlled. And the Romans had also created uh, something called indulgences, and this was either the full or partial remission of punishment for sins of the sinner if they would confess and receive absolution. So now the church was also controlling punishment and forgiveness. And the reformers said, no more. One of the first uh, reformers was a man named John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was a brilliant scholar and he chose to write in opposition to all the cardinal doctrines of faith and these writings and teachings would ultimately get him fired from his job at Oxford. He went on to translate the Bible from Latin into English. Wycliffe was also uh, followed by a whole series of godly people. Uh, John Huss, he was burned at the stake for his teachings. Martin Luther, who we all know, who was responsible for the Reformation in Germany. Uh, John Calvin, Eric Zwingli, uh, they both led the Swiss Reformation. The Anabaptists, they were descendants of Zwingli. William Tyndale, who translated the Bible from English, from the Greek and Hebrew. It's very difficult to uh, just estimate the profound impact that all of these people had on the church that we know today. From the late 1700s to the 1900s, there was this unprecedented turn in missionary work to get that gospel message out to the world. Colonization had opened many people's eyes to that need, that we need to, to have missionaries. And industrialization had made work like that uh, impossible before, but now it was economically possible. This also led to the um, Great Awakening, which had occurred from teachings like people like Jonathan Edwards. And as a result, during this time, churches were established all throughout the world in places that had never heard of Jesus. Followers of Jesus now began to span the globe. But the global body of more than two billion Christians was splintered into all of these factions and denominations. You had Pentecostal and Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptist, Apostolic, Methodist, the list goes on and on. Estimations show that there are more than 200 Christian denominations here in the U.S. and a staggering 45,000 across the world. How did it come to this? How did we go from meeting in homes to this? I mean, for whatever reason, the church is not the same today. 
as it was those first weeks of Pentecost. You know, we read Acts 2 last week. We can read it again. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think that sounds like a very close-knit, community-driven, personal, intimate group. We've gone from house churches to stadium churches. We've gone from pastors who have part-time jobs to pastors who now look more like CEOs and who run huge businesses. What happened? Well, over the course of the 20th century, capitalism preserved its momentum by molding the ordinary person into a consumer with this unquenchable desire for more stuff. The notion of human beings as a consumer first take shape uh, roughly after World War I, but it becomes very common in America by the 1920s. Coming out of the Depression and from the late 1940s on, young adults saw this remarkable rise in their spending power. Jobs were plentiful, wages were higher, and because there was a lack of consumer goods during the war, Americans were now very eager to spend money. And the church got swept up right along with it. In fact, many in our society today no longer become part of a local church to be in communion with God or to serve God. Today, they become part of a church to consume. In other words, they have a, what can this church do for me mentality. And because people started coming to church to consume, then the church felt like they had to adapt to the spiritual consumer. Church leaders began to look at the church as a business. They started to come up with ways they could make the product more appealing. They started to come up with ways to improve customer service. They started to come up with ways they could compete with the other church that was down the street. Today, the consumer-driven public wants churches to be full service and to provide everything they need. But what is the church? I mean, what is it supposed to be? We asked a thousand people, what's the purpose of the church? And 89% said that the purpose of the church was to take care of the spiritual needs of their people. And only 11% said the purpose of the church was to win the world for Jesus. It seems that today church growth isn't about kingdom growth anymore. To some, it is about who can have the biggest church and who can have the best programs. Should we be worried about church growth? Yes, I believe we should, but for different reasons. The reason we should be worried about church growth is because we want people to be a part of a loving, learning, growing, caring local church body. And if they're not, then they're missing out on those important ingredients that they need for their relationship with God. In other words, if you're not hearing the word of God, worshiping with other like-minded people, and working together as a body, you will not be growing in your faith, and consequently the body will not be growing the kingdom. Bottom line, the church needs to grow, but not to entertain and not to sustain the business the church needs to grow so that it brings the lost to Christ and helping those who are in Christ grow in their faith. At Walden Church, we define that with four words. We say, more Christians and better Christians. The church is responsible to make more Christians. That's evangelism. And to make better Christians. That's discipleship. You, personally, as an individual, you 
are supposed to love God and love others. But the church, as a body, we are called to make more Christians and better Christians. How do you grow the church? Well, I say we use the same church growth plan that the first century church used. Their plan worked because the first century church didn't just grow, it exploded with growth. It wasn't a perfect church, of course. It had problems, but they knew what to do. In Acts 2.42, that we just read, we find out that they had four foundational guides, four foundational things that they did that they also saw Jesus do. And that was the Acts 2 church was a worshiping church, an evangelizing church, a learning church, and a loving church. Now, I know that doesn't really look earth-shattering, right? It doesn't look remarkable. It certainly doesn't look new. But these are the things that helped that first century church grow. The first century church didn't have all the different programs that modern churches do or the ministries. They didn't try to entertain people. They just focused on the basics, and the result was the church grew. They did it without a team of pastors, without projectors, without colored lights, without pews, without buildings. In fact, this will really blow your mind, they didn't even have your Bible, right? They started as a worshiping church. Job one, you agree? When we come together, it's about worship. Singing, praying, the offering, we are here to worship God. Can you worship God from home? Absolutely, you can worship God from your home. But this is the number one thing we see the church body doing. Acts 2 says every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Worshiping is one of the most important things that we do. It is through praise and worship that we draw near to God. Psalm 100 says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving, that we enter into his courts with praise. Psalm 22 says that he inhabits the praises of all his people. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her, the hour has come. My worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father seeks such worshipers. Hebrews 13 says, through him let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of of lips that acknowledge his name. Worship is not performance time. It is not a concert for your audience. It is not to entertain you or even to make sure that we sing all the songs that you like. Worship is something you should do that comes from the heart of every individual. That is why it's so important for you to have your own praise and worship time with God. Psalm 71 says, my mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. It's in his presence that we find fullness of joy. It's in his presence that we find his will and that we change to his will. It's in his presence that we understand his word, that things that are, were hidden before are revealed. So we need to be worshiping God when we are away from church as much as we should be worshiping when we are together as a church. The quality of worship that you experience at your church is a reflection of the quality of worship that you experience during the week. In other words, if you come together with the rest of the church and you think, wow, the worship is really dull, it's kind of boring, it's dry, maybe it's because you haven't been flexing those worship muscles at home. When we become a person who begins to worship God all the time, We are becoming a person who's been made new. God wants us to be a worshiping church. Second, an evangelizing church. Evangelism was something that the first century took very seriously. Why? Because Jesus told them to do it. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. What was happening with the first century church was new. In the eyes of people, it was contagious. Their lifestyles, these Christians were living lifestyles that were arousing the curiosity of everyone who watched, and they started to investigate their lives to see if this thing was real. What was the lifestyle? 
It was a contagious lifestyle of love and compassion. The same lifestyle that we see modeled by Jesus. The same lifestyle that Jesus told the church to live. John 13 says, All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In the church today, we need to live lives of love. We need to be as contagious today as they were then. We need to be as excited about Jesus today as they were then. We need to be excited about God's love and his grace and his mercy. We need to be excited about his forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. If the church is healthy, if it's well-fed, if it's worshiping believers are excited about the things of God, it's going to reproduce itself. Psalm 105 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people. We have a great message to proclaim, and there is a world that desperately wants to hear it. Third, we need to be a learning church. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Another problem with many churches today, their leadership is too afraid to preach all the parts of the Bible. (laughs) They want their people to hear feel-good messages, feel-good sermons. And instead of hearing sermons about sin or hell or right and wrong or the righteousness that God requires of his children, Proverbs 1 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. We need Christians today who are not afraid to preach the truth of the Word of God. And we need churches today who are going to listen, who are going to learn, and who are going to obey. Now, does that mean that learning only comes from me, from paid staff? Of course not. This is what the Reformers fought for. Martin Luther, who I mentioned earlier, he said a simple layman armed with Scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. You have everything you need. You, you have everything you need to start your own Bible study at home. You have everything you need to start an Acts chapter 2 small group. Sing, sing a song, right? Sing one song. You don't need any instruments. Sing, pray, share a meal. You can do that. Read the scriptures. You can do that. The early church grew because they sat in circles. They learned in a circle. And to be a learning church, you need to be people who are willing to step up and teach and to be willing to learn from others. Not just your pastor. No, this last one we've been covering a lot lately, but I think we just need to repeat it. The last one is your church has to be a loving church. Acts 2 says all the believers were together. They had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. It's here, this one thing right here, that I think everything hinges on. And it's so clear in the Word of God. So, so obvious that Christians, the the Christian church needs to be a place that loves others. I mean, this command is so serious that it's part of the great commandment. This is one of the things that we talk about the most in the New Testament. Jesus told us to love over 20 times. So did the writings of Paul because it's important. The first century church loved each other. And as a result, they took care of each other. If someone had a need, help was there. Everyone was cared about, everyone was accepted, everyone was loved. How powerful is this? Powerful enough to have other people continue to join them daily. This is why Helping Hands, our ministry, Helping Hands, our Grief Share ministry, our Financial Peace ministry, our Stevens ministers are so important. But we shouldn't stop there. How else can you, our local church help the community? How else can the church that you attend, your local church, help its community? How do you show love to your neighbor? Look around you. Even the people that are sitting in this room today, each of us, all of us are commanded to love one another. 
If we look outside the walls, we see people who we work with, people who we live next to, the people we see at the store or the school or any place else, all of them. We are called to love all of them. The church is called to love. The ones who claim Christ and even the ones who don't. The ones who treat us right and even the ones who don't. The ones who are on the same financial page as we are, the ones who aren't and Catholics, and Lutherans, and Baptists, and Methodists, we are supposed to love sinners and saints. And like it or not, we are even called to love Muslims, the people who we led the Crusades against to kill. This is not saying we're supposed to love what they do, but we are supposed to love them and pray for them and bring the good news to them. This is why Jesus' church was a brand new thing. Nobody else was doing it that way. If we are going to be the kind of church that each of us need to make sure that the kingdom grows, that the gospel message gets out there, we need to examine our churches and ask, are we a worshiping church? Are we an evangelizing church? Are we a learning church? Are we a loving church? And then inwardly, ask those same questions of ourselves. Am I a worshiping Christian? Am I an evangelizing Christian? Am I a learning Christian? Am I a loving Christian? Wherever you are right now, I just want you to take a few moments and just pray to yourself. Ask God those questions. And if there's any deficiency, if there's any lack, ask that he would encourage. Let's pray. God, help your church to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Help us with all our interactions with one another, that we would have humble hearts, gentle hearts. Grant us patience for one another, bearing with one another in love. Grant the body of Christ unity. May we walk humbly with you allowing you to show us where we are wrong. Father God, you desire peace and unity and encouragement for your believers. Help us, Lord, to pursue what makes for peace and for building one another up, to pursue the things that will lead us to peace. Give us discerning hearts to know your will and give us the courage to be obedient. We know that without you and your Holy Spirit indwelling in each of us, we cannot do any of these things but with you and your spirit, we can do all things. We lift up churches. We lift up your word. We ask that we be willing, that we obey. Let us put others first. May we seek your will first. May we all become intercessors for our neighbors. May we pray more and criticize less. May we be encouragers and uplifters, evangelists and disciples. May we be preachers and teachers, but most of all, lovers. Amen. Well, thanks for sitting with us this morning. I hope that uh, you have been encouraged by this, and of course, we always hope that you learn a little bit. Uh, I want to remind you that we are a local church in Montgomery, Texas, and we are uh, open all the time. We have services every single Sunday, one at 9.30, which is our traditional service. We have a choir. We're going to sing hymns. We're going to do responsive readings. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. We're going to have communion. We're going to have potlucks. It's everything that you remember about church growing up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service with the worship team. Please come casual. Please bring your kids. We've got a full program from birth all the way through high school, and we want to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.